Well, good morning, Movement Church. How y'all doing this morning? Wow, I see that the cold has stifled every ounce of energy that you have. There's actually some batteries that have been drained out of how cold it's been. So I left the, the beach background here to remind us that we do still live in Florida. It's going to be okay. The heat is coming. Well, either way, I'm still really glad that you guys are here today. And if you are new, please text NEW to MC to the number on your screen. It should be 94,000. There should be some instructions coming up there soon. Uh, th the point of texting that is just so that we can get to know you and you can get to know us so that we can get in touch with each other and see how we can partner together to advance the kingdom of God in Charlotte County. So with that being said, we've done this for a long time. You guys definitely know what this is, but just in case, this is the blue ping pong ball and this is the white one and we have a board in the back where we deposit these the blue one is a relational one which is the come and see ping pong ball this is if you have invited someone to come and see what god is doing through our church and in our community at all you just take one of these they're in the back you write the person's name that you've invited and deposit it in the board and this is the white ping pong ball which is the go and tell ping pong ball. So if you've had any conversation that is uh, based on Ch Ch Jesus and his church or any sort of salvific oriented conversation, please write the person's name and deposit them. The purpose is that over the years as we've done this, we've been able to see how God has been impacting our community. And it also makes it really easy for us to pray as we pass th th through that hallway for those names that God has been tugging at their heart. So I just want to remind you all of that. And lastly, as you know, with how we have changed the name and such, a lot of things have been rerouted. So this is a great time to be able to connect with us on social media, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. The handle is Movement Church FL. So with that being said, please rise and let's worship our King this morning.
we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord.
So as I was preparing this week for the, uh, the worships that we can bring the house lights up, sometimes you look something up and you forget what it means, and I'm in the business of knowing what you're actually singing. So can I get an amen for those of you who either don't know or forgot what Ebenezer even means? That's what I thought. <laughs> but it, nonetheless, it's a beautiful hymn that we just sang, and so... Uh, really that word comes from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And so the story in this section of scripture is that Samuel's th th one of the judges of Israel at uh, this time, and he, uh, the Israelites have rebelled against God. And uh, the Philistines are upon them. They're about to lose. They're about to perish, really. And they go up to Samuel and they say, I don't know what's going on. And Samuel just tells them, you need to repent as a people that you have strayed away from God, that you need to offer sacrifices, and I'll pray, and we'll see how God intercedes. And so they do all those things, and when the Philistines are upon them, um, not only does God deliver the Israelites from the Philistines' hands, but actually delivers the Philistines into the Israelites' hands. And so there's a great victory that happens. And that's where this passage picks up. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. It says this, Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mishpah and Jeshana, and he named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help or helping stone. It's really a monument to commemorate and remember something that happened in that place. And then it goes on to say, for he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped. And so here's something that got me thinking as I was looking into that again. And uh, this last Christmas is actually my sixth Christmas here. I've been here for five and a half years, and that's great. But what it made me think was, wow, God has helped this church far before I got here. And this church has a history of being the hands and feet of Jesus. But I can just count so many things that have happened in my time here, everything from building orphanages across the, the world to our Vision Impact partners to Hurricane Relief for Hurricane Marie in Puerto Rico many years ago, which I'm still super thankful for. Uh, and it just reminded me that God has been generous to us. Amen? And so in the same way that out of that generosity is what God has called us to be generous. And I thought of all those events and how they have really transpired because of your generosity and submission to God. So thank you. So there should be some instructions on the screen if you ha have ever given an offering, anything like that, everything from phone number to text to a website to QR code. But let's just lean in in this moment and just give God thanks. Because I know that when I was reflecting in my life, man, could you imagine how many Ebenezers we could all put up from every moment that we've had in our life where God has interceded on our behalf without us even asking, maybe without us even wanting him to. And so let's just reflect on that, praise God, and ask him to bless the offering. Heavenly Father, we are so little and you are so big. And for that, we thank you. We thank you that every moment where we experience crisis and disarray. You are there in that you have provided and will continue to provide. And so, Lord, we ask for that provision and for that generosity to be upon this offering. May it be stewarded well, may it be used to advance your kingdom and make your name great in Charlotte County, the regions around us, to the ends of the earth. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. And God's people said,
Amen. With that, with that being said, please rise. Let's continue worshiping him.
confess this morning that having you a second is not sufficient. So Lord, I ask that you examine our hearts, refine its impurities, remove the things that distract us so that we can have all of you and that we may be emissaries of your word and your gospel, representing you well. So Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. In heaven. Hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in on heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. We also have forgiven our debtors. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you all today. Uh, I'm uh, I'm cold. You guys, this is that's all I can say. But it's good to be here. Uh, it's good to be uh, able to share with you uh, and continue in this this series on what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And uh, Pastor Nate has been just really this this series has been really really uh, impactful. I know for a lot of folks have been coming to me and talking to me about this um, the prayer in our lives, and and uh, it's been it's been cool to hear from Pastor Nate as we started the series a couple of weeks ago. We're going to review now because, you know, I'm kind of an educator. That's what we do. We review. So we're going to review now kind of what we've talked about before. We talked about what prayer is and, and what prayer is not, right? We said that, that um, prayer is not about performance or persuasion. It's not trying to get God to do something. Um, Nate used a really cool analogy. He said prayer is kind of like a, the people mover of faith. And uh, when, he, when he broke that down a little bit, you know, it was the idea that we're able to do and move in our Christian life things a little bit more efficiently, sometimes a little, more, a little bit more quickly, right? And at those times when we feel like we've got nothing else and nothing to give and we're exhausted, that people mover of faith allows us to keep moving, right? As we, as we pray, we can, we can rest and, and, we can, um, and, and we can regain some of that energy that we need while continuing to move forward in prayer. And we learn that when Jesus... Uh, unpack this for his disciples. He said, listen, we, we can pray like this. He didn't say this is the prescriptive way in which you pray. Don't repeat these exact words, but not paint by numbers, but rather here's a framework for the manner in which you can pray, right? And then we learn that we pray to the Father. And Jesus didn't just say fa the Father. He said our Father, my Father and your Father. And so we recognize as we pray, we are praying to the Father of Jesus, who is also our Father. And we learn that that Father is in heaven, right? And that gives us some perspective on things, right? I love that quote from last week so much, I wrote it right into my Bible next to the Lord's Prayer, where he said that he can see what we don't, and he can do what we can't, which was amazing. And then we learn that 
that he is hallowed, he's holy, he's set apart. He's not a man that can be manipulated through our fancy words, right? He's almighty God. And then this week, this week, we're going to be focusing in on, hey, that was a little fast. We're going to be focusing in on thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, as we prepare to do this, though, one thing that I want to really look at is this idea of the kingdom. The kingdom of God and what normally comes to mind for us when we think of a kingdom, or at least when I think of a kingdom. A lot of times I'll think of, uh, you know, some maybe old books or stories or movies. I might think of like Robin Hood or King Arthur and Holy Grails and murderous bunny rabbits and things like that. Some of you will get that. Some of you have no clue. That's okay. Uh, maybe you think of like Lord of the Rings or but no matter what it is, you might think about, uh, as we look at what's a kingdom, you might think about a site, something like this, right? This, the moats and the castles. And, and um, this is actually a picture that I took with my cell phone of the kingdom, what used to be the kingdom of Toledo in Spain, or for you fellow gringos that did not grow up in Miami, Toledo. Okay, that the, was the kingdom of Toledo Spain, all right? It was established in 1065, um, and, it, and it remained as a kingdom until 1833. I had the privilege of visiting this city um, while I was on a vision trip with some other pastors. The Alliance has quite a few missionaries in Spain, which is a very um, unreached nation, way more so than you might think. Uh, but they have a lot of missionaries and pastors and church plants that are strategically placed all throughout the country, and we got to go visit them and see kind of what that's about. But of all the places we went, this was probably my favorite. And one of the reasons is because as we went through the city, we were visiting all these shops, and they had the coolest stuff there, you guys. They had, like, suits of armor and, like, these, these swords and shields and, like, battle axes and just the cool manly stuff, right? And I liked it. I liked it so much that I bought some stuff. I bought this. Uh, I bought this cool-looking axe. Uh, I really wanted to get a sword, but it, it didn't fit as well in my carry-on bag. So I got this instead, but uh, there were some really neat things. Um, I bought this. I bought some pocket knives for my boys, and I bought some jewelry for Danielle. And, and I got to thinking as I was holding this up, and I was looking at some of the other blades. There are some of these to Toledo blades. And I said, man, I wonder... Does this, does this have a connection to our little town in Port Charlotte? And my mind just got to, I couldn't let it go. And, and so I did a little bit of research. And because of that, you get to participate in useless knowledge <laughs> with Dwayne. So if you're from out of town or if you're watching this online, I'm going to apologize in advance for this. But um, here we go. The kingdom of Toledo has been controlled by various empires and nations. The original rulers of the region were the Phoenicians, which uh, originally were from the Middle East, so Syria, Jordan, that kind of area. Toledo has been ruled by the Moors, the Visigoths, and various other Germanic tribes before later being incorporated into Spain. Now, one thing that Toledo is famous for, as I told you a minute ago, was its Damascus forging and foundry techniques, right? Historically, it was, it's famous for its weapons making, its jewelry making. Uh, they make what's called Damascene jewelry. Danielle's wearing hers today, if you ever want to take a look at her really cool earrings. Um, but the idea is that, that they incorporate the use of more than one metal, right, in the, in the production process. So what does that have to do with Port Charlotte? I'm glad you asked. Uh, so in the 1800s, a city in Ohio was founded and named Toledo after the city in Spain. Now, reasons for this are debated by historians, but many believe that the unique and creative ways in which they manufactured glass in Toledo, Ohio, somehow mimicked the quality of metals that were made in Toledo, Spain, and that's how the connection was made. But regardless, the city was named such, and later, in 1835, the town founded a newspaper and named it the Toledo Blade. What does that have to do with Port Charlotte? I'm glad you asked. Fast forward to Florida, 1954. The Mackle Brothers of Miami partnered with a Canadian 
real estate company, investment firm, and began development in Port Charlotte. They began over on Easy Street. Now, side note on the Mackle brothers, if you go down Midway, just a little ways, you'll see the Elkham Waterway and Elkham Boulevard, which is Mackle spelled backwards. That's useless knowledge inside of useless knowledge. You're welcome. <laughs> so, one of the directors of this development company, Thomas Ferris, was a former reporter for the aforementioned newspaper, the Toledo Blade. And as surveyors began laying out the different streets, all those streets had to be named. Eventually, creativity was running low. The Mackle brothers did a lot of business in advertising in Ohio. So the next time you're on 41, driving really slow behind an Ohio license plate in the left lane, you can thank the Mackle brothers for that. Uh, but uh, so they advertised a lot in one newspaper in particular, the Toledo Blade. So former reporter, now real estate developer Ferris, suggested the idea of honoring his old newspaper by naming a street after it. And now we have Toledo Blade Boulevard, which I drive on almost every day. And that is how our little town in Port Charlotte is connected to the former kingdom, now province of Toledo, Spain. This has been Useless Knowledge. <laughs> Dwayne. Mm. All that to say the kingdom of God is not like that at all. The kingdom of God does not change hands. It's not about a realm. It's not about castles and moats or any of that. The kingdom of God is not about conquest. Broadly speaking, it's the rule of a sovereign God over all the universe. The kingdom of God is about his reign. The psalmist said the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all, even the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of arguably one of the greatest empires ever upon the earth, Babylon, writes these words about our God in Daniel chapter 4. He says, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. He sits on the throne over all the universe, and his kingdom and reign are sovereign over all things. He has absolute power absolute authority. We read in Romans 13, all authority comes from God, and, in the, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. And when we think about that kind of authority and that kind of power, in human terms, it can be a little frightening. I mean, we have that saying, you know, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. With man, that would be true. We would never want a man to have that kind of power or authority over us or in our lives. And yet with God, if you know him, you know that his reign is for our good. His purpose, after all, he came to redeem us, to redeem mankind, to seek and save the lost. You know, there's a quote that you see sometimes around Christmas time. It says, a thousand times a baby has become a king in history, but only once in history did a king become a baby. See, he came, but not in the way that was expected. We read, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It would have been really easy for Jesus to just come and assume the throne, right? But he chose a cross instead. He would become king, but through crucifixion and resurrection. So he didn't come just to conquer the world, but to conquer sin and death, and he chose that for you and me. So that said, the kingdom of God is still not even as simple as all that. You can think of it as an, as an already but not yet kingdom. When Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God in the Gospels, the kingdom is both present at that time and still to come. And so I want to look at those two ideas, the already kingdom and the not yet kingdom. I want to start here. The already kingdom is the one that has come in my life. Thy kingdom come is a spiritual rule over our hearts when we willingly submit to his authority. Now, it's funny because we in the Western world, particularly in the U.S., we're not big on the submitting to authority thing. I mean, we're, we're the United States. You know what I mean? We were, we were founded out of rebellion to tyranny. Like, we threw tea in the harbor, Right? <laughs> I mean, that's, we did that. Like, we bootstraps, and we declared our independence. We blaze our own trails, right? 
Um, but ironically, at the same time, we also submit ourselves to a lot of really dumb things. Um, in our personal pursuits, sometimes we pledge our allegiance to earthly things like money or sports teams, and sometimes our borderline or outright worshipful behavior toward things like political candidates or ideologies or agendas. And I would ask us, what if we were as vocal about the kingdom of God that's come into our lives as we were about our favorite candidate or political issue? And, uh, and if that makes you uh, upset, then you can email Pastor Nate at Movement uh, Church FL. I'm sorry. What's my point there? We cannot serve two masters, right? If the kingdom of God is going to come in my life, I have to submit unequivocally. I have to be willing to give up all of those other things at, at least long enough to see, do they still fit when he reigns and rules in my heart? Are those things still still appropriate in my life, right? Do they fit under his authority? And you might be saying, well, gosh, that seems like it's asking a lot. And it is. It is. But it's easy to give things up for a God who gave everything up for you. It's easy to serve a God and follow a leader that not only wants the best for you, but loves you and knows you better than anyone else ever could. It's easy to give it up for a king who came to give us life and life to the full. And see, when his kingdom comes in our lives, it brings about that perspective that Pastor Nate was talking to us about last week. In fact, I was thinking about that, and I was listening to the radio, and I heard this quote, and I can't believe I've never heard it before, because there's so many great C.S. Lewis quotes that I've heard, but listen to this one. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. When we allow the kingdom of God to come in our lives, it helps us take all of those other things. It gives us the perspective that we need to prioritize or perhaps deprioritize things that we feel so strongly about in our lives. And listen, that can sound hard, but it's also really liberating because it means like we don't have to be the sheriff of everything. We can let some stuff go. We don't have to worry about keeping all the plates spinning. It reminds me of like some, some recent changes that have taken place here at the church, even with me in, in, like in my position as I've transitioned in, into this role as associate pastor after like a decade in student ministry. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's been great. It's been really good. Uh, and Seth is the new student pastor. And y'all, Seth is doing an amazing job. If you haven't seen him or spoken to him, uh, please stop and see. He's awesome. And um, so, but if you know me at all, you'll know that I'm super passionate about student ministry, which is why you should also, when you see Seth, ask him about serving in student ministry. Um, but I love student ministry, and so I immediately went to him and said, hey, I want to be on your team. Is, do you have a place for me in student ministry? And, and he said yes, which was super nice. And now I lead what I like to call the best small group ever, the sixth grade boys. I got a couple of my, where, do I have any other sixth grade boys in here? My awesome boys. I have this great group, right, and I get to, I get to just, guys, I get to just have fun now, right? When I go on Wednesday nights, like, I don't have to, it's like, it's, it's not my circus. I still have a few monkeys, but it's not my circus. Like, I don't have to do everything. And so, and then now still sometimes because I was here for, did this for so long, people will still bring, like, issues and problems to me regarding student ministry, and I'll just smile at them, and, and I'll listen, and I'll say, yeah, that's, wow, that's tough. You should go tell Seth about that. <laughs> so, so it's, it's been liberating, because here's the thing, like, I know that Seth is a great leader, and, and I know that Seth loves the students, and I know that Seth loves his leaders and cares about his leaders. That includes me, and so it's really easy, it's really easy for me to step back and say he's got this he's got this, right Listen, God wants to establish his kingdom in your life and he's good, he's good so, so like relax, you get to kind of sit back and submit to him, let his kingdom come in your life right, and then when you do that, then you can, can, you can pray for that not yet kingdom Thy kingdom come on the earth. 
See, his kingdom is here now through his people. It's here in you and in me, but it's also coming, right? In that sense, it's not yet. The literal rule and reign of Christ on the earth will come. Guys, I read all the way to the last chapter, and I don't want to spoil it or anything, but he wins, okay? Um, listen to what, the, how uh, it's put in the book of Daniel. It says, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. You see similar prophecies in Obadiah, uh, Habakkuk, Micah, Zechariah. Christ sets up his spiritual reign in the church, and one, and, and one day he'll set up his physical reign here on the earth. So his kingdom is already, and it's available to all who submit to him as he rules in the hearts of his people, and it's specific and not yet as the work that he's begun on earth will come to its completion. And listen, we should pray for both of those things. We should pray for it to come into our lives, but man, we should pray in anticipation for that day when he comes back for his bride, right? For his physical kingdom to be ushered in, because it's going to be awesome. The day is going to come when everything is made right. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes, like, don't you just get tired of all this? I mean, the, the injustice, poverty, hunger, illness, cancer, abuse, insurance companies. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but not really. Um, sometimes our hearts can grow weary. Like, this world is hard. Bad things seem like they happen to good people. It's not fair. Cheaters get ahead. The rich get richer. The poor get poorer. Then you see, like, people that you know and love and care about, and it just seems like trial after struggle after hard thing. Or maybe that's your story, and it's just constantly, you're like, God, why? Why don't you just come and fix it? It's the good news is, guys, is he is coming, and he will fix it. In fact, if you continue in this verse, it says, it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. It's okay for us to pray. Like, Maranatha, come, Lord. Come set up your kingdom on earth like it is in heaven. It's kind of like reading a really suspenseful book or watching a movie that you've already seen. Like, you're still like in it, and it's like, whoa, but you know, you know it's coming. Like you know the end, right? So how do we do this practically? How do we pray for his kingdom to come in our lives and physically on the earth? Well, it's a prayer that's born out of partnership. It's a prayer of partnership. You guys ever partner with somebody on anything? You ever have to pick a lab partner when you were in school? You guys remember that? Yeah. Um, there were a few times in my life when I had to pick a lab partner. Now, Depending on what my goal was, I would choose my lab partner carefully, all right? So if I wanted to have a lot of fun during the assignment and if I wanted to laugh a lot, um, I would choose my best friend Jay to be my lab partner. Jay and I, we met in the sixth grade, and we were mortal enemies that year for the whole sixth grade. Um, but somehow, seventh grade, I, I don't know how it happened, but we became best friends. After that, we're still best friends to this day. In fact, he drove all the way here from Daytona Beach just to hear me preach today. So he's, he's here somewhere. I'm not going to point him out. Um, but uh, I'll never forget he and I were in Mr. Rittenberg's fifth grade period in seventh grade. Mr. Rittenberg was our science teacher. Much to his chagrin, Jay and I sat right up front at a table there, probably on front, front on purpose. Mr. Rittenberg used to call us the long and the short of it. Because, yeah, because Jay was about six feet tall back then, and I was all of about four foot nothing. And um, so we were the long and the short of it. And I remember in science class one day, uh, Jay and I paired up to dissect an earthworm. All right? Now, most of the students in the class were listening very carefully to the instructions and prepping everything. Right? They had like that, that, that weird like baking pan with the rubber in the bottom of it. You guys remember doing that in science class? Science class is so weird. Uh, I'm not sure what we were supposed to have done, but, but as we were getting ready, I know that we had named our worm Gertrude um, and that she 
uh, looked like she was pinned down by a toddler, and she had this mysterious kink in her dorsal annuli. And, and uh, now, if, if you talk to Jay, he'll, he'll tell you that that's my fault, okay? But, but I can promise you, Jay, you know in your heart of hearts that you, you messed it up. It was your fault. That, and, and listen, um, if the point of all this is, is that, like, Jay and I, we're good buddies. We had a, we had a great time doing that lab, but we did not, we did not do very well. I don't think we got very good grades at all. Now, in, in fact, um, nope, I'll go back to that. If I wanted to get a good grade, I probably would have chosen Joanne Spiroff, who sat at the next table. She got A's on everything. She was always ready for class. She followed the directions. Um, Joanne, if I ever have to dissect an earthworm, if you're watching online, um, I will message you because we know that Jay will mess it up. But um, what's the point of that? It, it's it's this, if you're going to partner with someone, then especially for something as important as prayer, maybe we should partner with someone who can do it all. Wouldn't we want to partner with our Father in heaven, right? When we recognize that we're praying to our Father, we pray for his kingdom to come in our lives, to let his kingdom come in us and through us. It's that recognition that our Father in heaven wants to bring about something important in our lives, and rather than resist that, rather than fight against that, Let's get on that people mover of faith, right? And let him do his thing. He's coming one day, but in the meantime, he wants to start something in us and finish something in us. And he doesn't force himself on us. He wants to partner with us. And that partnership, you might have guessed it earlier, is for our growth. It's for our growth. See, had I partnered with Joanne on dissection day, I probably would have gotten a decent grade, and I wouldn't have had to Google parts of an earthworm to prepare for this message. Uh, when we partner with our Father in heaven, the one who can see what we don't and can, who can do what we can't, we learn and we grow. And we do that a couple of ways. The first is through a suppression of ourselves. See, when you pray your kingdom come, your will be done. It's a suppression of yourself. And this is, it's pretty counterintuitive. I mean, at least it is for me. Um, it's kind of the opposite of what we normally do. Normally, we're looking for our will, our preferences, our ideas, our thoughts, our goals, and that's what we want. Um, and a lot of times, in fact, instead of, instead of waiting and, and praying about something, a lot of times I'll have what, what I call a pre-conversation. Do you guys ever do this? Where you like have a conversation in your head before it happens in real life? Any, any, okay, I'm the only, okay, good, there's two of us, that's good. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll do that. And some of you know that, that for, uh, for many years I was a, I was a teacher because that's what lousy students do. They become teachers later. Just, it's just a cosmic thing. Um, but I remember one time I worked with this principal who was strong-willed. We'll call her strong-willed. And um, she had made a decision that, that I didn't agree with at all. And, um, and I went into her office to have a very calm, rational conversation about the decision that she made that was wrong. And, um, but I went in, and, and honestly, I was super respectful. I really was. And I went in and said, hey, this is just, you know, maybe you could reconsider because whatever, and laid out my case. And, and um, she did not take it well at all. As a matter of fact, she yelled, and she was rude, and uh, her door was open, and I know, like, the whole office heard it. If there were any kids or parents in there, they heard it, the receptionist, the, everybody heard it, and um, I'm, proud, I'm, I'm proud of this part anyway. I was very calm, and I said, Mrs. Principal, whose name I won't say, um, I'm, I'm a professional. And she didn't know who I picked as a lab partner in seventh grade, so she totally bought that part. Um, I said, I'm a professional, and I would like to have professional conversations with you, and I would like for you to speak to me in a professional way. So please keep that in mind for our future interactions. And I left her office. And that was the end of the conversation in her office at that moment. It was not, however, the end of the conversation in my head. Because I began to plan our next conversation right away. Okay. <laughs> I started coming up with all the words I would say, the phrases I would use, the, the arguments that I would, would have for each of her points. And, uh, and that ramped up even more once uh, she called down and said that she wanted to speak to me at my next planning period. 
And so needless to say, I mean, that, that conversation just lived rent-free in my head for that whole time, right? I'm, I'm going on. We're having it. It's just playing over and over in my mind. Paid no attention to my students. I have no idea what we did that day. Um, but, uh, but anyway, as time went on, um, I, I'm embarrassed to say that it never occurred to me until I was just beginning to walk in her office that I had not prayed about that conversation at all. And so feeling that little bit of conviction, I shot one up real quick <laughs> and walked into her office. And she looked at me and she said, I am so sorry. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. And in fact, I've really been thinking about it and you were right. And I really want your input on how we can fix whatever and so on. And so um, how much energy did I waste having pre-conversations that never came to fruition at all, right? And what if I had simply instead walked out of her office and lifted myself up and her up in prayer and asked God, would your will be done in this situation, in, in, in our lives, your perfect will? What if I were less worried about being right? And what if I were less worried about my right to be offended and simply just submit it to his will? His will that was going to happen regardless because he's God. <laughs> what if I just trusted him to do what he was going to do anyway? Fortunately, I didn't have time to do this. You guys ever do this? When somebody makes you upset, you go around to other people. Thank God it was my first planning period because I didn't have time to do this. But, you know, I, I was, I'm sure I would have gone around to other teachers and said, you know what she did? Can you, can you believe she said that to me? I mean, who does she think she is? You should totally be mad at her for me right? You guys ever do that? Like you try to like get people on your team, right? Thankfully, I didn't do that, right? But we often work on our own strength and we manipulate and we position ourselves to get the most favorable outcome for ourselves rather than trusting God to do it for us. Now contrast that with Jesus, particularly Jesus in the garden. You might remember this, the night he ate his final meal with his disciples during his earthly ministry. The night he would be betrayed, accused, arrested, denied, convicted, and later beaten, crucified. Oh, I've had my share of bad days, and I'm sure you have too, but never had a day like that. And if ever there would have been a time for somebody to seek their own agenda, right? Seek their own will and their own preferred outcome, it would be this occasion. But instead, Jesus prays this. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You know, it would have been easy to say, Father, I've done a lot of things down here for you. <laughs> I mean, I've done everything you've asked. And I've been thinking, I've got an idea I'd like to try instead of whole, this whole, like, torturous, murderous death on a cross thing. Um, but he didn't do that. He didn't do that. Immediately he says, listen, here's my preference, but I want what you want. How was he able to submit in this way? How is that even possible? Yes, he's fully God, but he was also fully man. But this wasn't what you might call his first rodeo either. Verse 39 reminds us it was his custom to pray in this way. It was his custom to get away on his own as part of his natural rhythm to find a quiet place to pray and to seek the Father and to seek his will. And it's also not the first time Jesus wrestled with this idea. You might recall earlier in Luke's account in chapter 4, when Satan tempts him in the desert, he says, listen, all you got to do is bow down to me and you can have it all. The easy way. You can just take it right now. But Jesus made up his mind even in that moment and quoted scripture and said, listen, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus knew even then, though, what the harder path would mean. Maybe that's why he was so harsh when, when, when he rebukes Peter, right? When Peter, like, balks at the idea of, of Jesus being crucified, of him dying and being uh, resurrected from the grave, and, and Jesus stops him. He says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> wow. I've been called a lot of things before, but yikes. Jesus, though, was submitted to the Father's will, and still he comes to him in humility and brokenness and says, Lord, I'd really rather not do it this way. But if it's your way, so be it. 
He suppresses his own self and yields instead to what the Father wants. And so our prayer is one of partnership as we suppress ourselves and then also ooh, as we surrender to holiness. When we read, hallowed be your name, last week, we acknowledged that our Father is holy. He's set apart. He is powerful. He is everywhere, y'all. Omnipresent. The psalmist writes, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I, if I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. He's omniscient. He knows everything. The psalmist says, even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. He counts the number of stars, and he gives names to all of them. In Matthew, we read, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Admittedly, that's an easy one when it comes to me. Um, Jesus is just like, yeah, he's zero. There's, there's nothing there. Um, he's all powerful, omnipotent. We read in, in Genesis when he speaks to Abraham, he says, Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return you at this time next year. And Sarah, your 90-year-old wife, will have a son. Luke writes, says there's nothing impossible with God. We read in Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Does that sound like a God worth partnering with? Does it sound like a God we should resist. I think, if anything, I, I, it leaves me wondering, why would he want to partner with me? And the answer is because he, he loves me. And he loves you. And when we finally get this, we can align our will to his, our heart to his, our desires with his. It's like this verse. Maybe you've read this verse before. I remember reading this verse as a, as a little, little kid, and I didn't get it. I was about seven or eight years old, and I remember reading, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And when I was a little kid, guys, I desired to be taller. I was little. I was really short. I mean, I didn't like being called the short of it. I wanted to be able to tell the long of it for once. And I remember praying and asking God, like, my heart really desires to be taller. Can you just make me taller? And it, it never happened. I mean, eventually, got a little taller. But um, later, though, I, 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 later, years later, I came to realize that I had been reading that wrong. No one had really taken the time to really uh, unpack this verse for me and help me really under, understand it, right? Because it doesn't say he will give you whatever your heart desires. He doesn't say that. In fact, that would be a terrible idea. Terrible idea. The prophet Jeremiah writes, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? God would not be wise to grant us whatever it is that our hearts desire. But I later learned to read that verse like this. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, when we pray and we submit to him in his will, when we pray your will be done, he places the desires in our heart, the right desires. See, our prayer or partnership is not about trying to change God's mind or to, to get him to do something for us. Rather, it's about aligning ourselves with him, with his will. We're asking God to place in us the right desires desires. And we do that in partnership also, not just for our growth, but for his glory. Perhaps you've seen this verse before. I hope you have. This verse is about us. Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And many of you have heard this, this Greek word workmanship is poema. And we equate it to something like the idea of, of a masterpiece, a creation for which he is extremely joyful and proud, right? I want you to think of it like this. I'm going to show you some pieces of art, because I know some of you in here are very cultured, okay? 
So I'm going to give you a little quiz and see how cultured you are. I know some of you are also from Ohio, um, so you guys will be extra cultured. Extra cultured, that's all I'm saying. I'm not, no offense. Um, but I'm going to show you a painting, and I want you to see if you can identify the painting and maybe who the artist is. So let's, so let's see. I'm going to start off with an easy one, an easy one here. Uh, this lady. Who's that? That's the Mona Lisa, painted by? Leonardo, not Leonardo DiCaprio. Come on. <laughs> like Leonardo da Vinci. In this painting right now, if you wanted to see it, the real original, you'd have to fly all the way to Paris and go to the Louvre, see this painting. How about this one here? Ooh, that's a harder one. I, I just call it the melted clock thing. Um, but it's actually called the persistence of memory. Anybody know the artist? Dolly, right? Salvador Dolly, right? Not Dolly Parton. Salvador Dolly. That is uh, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. If you wanted to go see that, you could go see that. How about this one here? Ooh. It's super familiar. Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you remember that? Him staring at that one, right? This is by George Sorrow. It's called A Sunday Afternoon in Some French Place. I don't know what it's called. I'm sorry. Some of you know. I'm bet some of you out there know. Um, my, my high school art teacher, though, she, she called him Surratt instead of Sorrow, and she said that you could remember, this is an example of pointillism, because she said Surratt knew a lot about dots, and that's how, <laughs> that's how you could remember this style of painting. But anyway, what's the point? How do we know, first of all, that the artists that created these paintings even exist? How do you and I know? Because we never met them. We know because their work exists, right? Their handiwork, their poema exists. How do we know that they were talented? Well, we can look at their work and we can see that they existed, that they were talented. I mean, imagine these artists could have possessed the abilities and the talents to do this and just not done it. I mean, what if Michelangelo was like, oh, that ceiling's too high. I'm just not doing that, right? Why did these artists paint? Why do people make music or sing? Why do men create with their hands? Why do, we, why do we build things? We do this, the answer is we do this because it's an expression of ourselves, right? And have you ever thought about this? Like humans are the only creatures that create. Why is that? Well, the answer is because God created us in his image. And he is a God who creates. Like right? creatives create. That's what we do. And the artists and the artwork that we saw, that we mentioned, that those artists all created something important, right? Something precious and exceedingly valuable, so much so that they're kept locked up in these museums and they're protected from fire and vandalism and theft and even things like dust or harmful light. But my friends, how much more valuable are you? God's workmanship, his poema. He created you, and he created you for a purpose, that verse said, to walk in those things, those, those good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. Um, how do people know God exists? How do they know he's good? They can see you, his workmanship. There is nobody like you. No one. Your existence and your presence in this world and in the lives of others should alert them to the fact that there is a loving and creative God that does and makes amazing and beautiful things. We represent him. All men wonder, all men wonder, what's my purpose? Why am I here? What, what am I doing? Why was I created? And the answer is that we exist to bring him glory. We reflect his goodness. We reflect his beauty. And we do that no better do we do that than when we partner with him. When we say, not my will, yours be done. Would you partner in prayer with him today? Would you say and pray, your kingdom come right now in my life. In your kingdom that is to come. Lord, bring it. I'm ready. Would you submit your will to his, knowing that he's your father in heaven who sees what you don't and who does what you can't? Would you do this today for your growth 
and for his glory. Would you pray with me? Father, we choose today. We choose to partner with you in prayer. We don't understand why you would choose to partner out with us. Thank you that you do. Lord, may your kingdom come today. Would it come in our lives? Lord, we look forward to the day when you set your kingdom up on earth, when you make this right, when you put an end to the evil, to the pain and to the suffering. But until that time, Until that time, would you help us submit our own will to yours? Would you place the right desires in us so that we can grow and live out our purpose while at the same time reflecting your beauty and your goodness? And we ask this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, uh, before you gather up your keys and start jingling them around and walking out, just a couple of things I want to remind you about that we have coming up. Uh, At the end of this month, we are going to be holding baptisms. Uh, If you have not taken that step of obedience and and been baptized and you are interested in that, you can uh, scan that QR code there and uh, it will bring you to a page. You're not committing and saying that you have to do anything, but someone will contact you. We'll make sure that we can answer any questions that you have about baptism, what it is, what it isn't, why it's important. And, uh, and if you uh, decide at that time, it's, that's your next step, and we will get you signed up. And uh, again, that'll happen the last Sunday of this month. Also, uh, our Discover class, I, apparently I'm not the best at making slides, but our Discover class, uh, we had one actually that just took place this morning at the 930 service. That is, uh, we have our Discover Movement Church class and our Discover Serve class. Those are classes that are great for folks that are either new to this church, or maybe you've been here for a while and you're like, you know, I've never done that. I'd like to know a little bit more about it. Great opportunity for you to learn who we are, what we're about, what our mission is, what our values are, and how that drives everything that we do. And then after that, if you think, you know what, maybe this is my church. Maybe these are my people. How do I get more involved? How do I find out more about serving and getting connected here? That's what our Discover Serve class is about. So we would encourage you to uh, hit that QR code and learn a little bit more about that. And with that now, if you want to get your keys out and start jingling them, you can go, hey, thank you for uh, giving me this time and allowing me to be with you. I really enjoyed um, our time this morning. God bless you guys. Have a great weekend.